So in this video, we're going to be demonstrating and deriving the patterns that we expect when we have light diffracting through a single slit. So to do this, we need a coherent source of light. And so in this case, we're going to be using a laser, such as this laser pointer. And we're going to be looking at what happens when light passes through a single slit. Now, what we're interested in doing with light is actually calculating the pattern that we expect to see. And so to do that, we're going to use Huygens principle. And if you remember, Huygens principle states that every single point on the away front can be treated as a source of waves and used to calculate the next wave front. And that's exactly what we're going to do uh, to calculate our diffraction pattern. We're going to treat each point on the wavefront that's coming out of the slit as a point source. And we're going to use, uh, we're going to add together the waves from all of those point sources to calculate the next wavefront. However, if we actually do that using the true geometry, the maths is truly horrendous. And you end up with, if you're looking at close to the slit, you end up with something that's called Fresnel diffraction, which requires a good deal of maths in order to calculate it properly. So what we're going to do is we're going to make an approximation, and we're going to look in what's called Fraunhofer diffraction. And that's the diffraction pattern that you get when you are a long way from the, uh, the slit or the object or whatever the uh, light is passing through and causing the diffraction. And if we look a long way from the slit, we can make the approximation that the rays of light are approximately parallel, and that really simplifies the maths. So let's start off by having a look at the maths behind diffraction from a single slit. So here we have a diagram that shows a single slit and it's being illuminated by coherent light. And so by that, I mean that the phase of the light, it's, it's plane waves, and so the phase of the light is the same all the way along the slit. Incoherent light would generate different phases randomly changing all the way along the slit. Now, what I've drawn here are parallel uh, rays of light. So these all go off uh, into the distance to some screen that's a long, long way over here. And I'm going to assume that the distance to the screen for this ray down the center here, that the screen is a distance r away um, from the center of the slit. Now, if I look at the light coming from this little part of the wavefront here, this uh, part of the wavefront travels a extra distance here before it gets to the same distance that the uh, light from the center of the slit has to travel. And so this has to travel an extra distance of y times the sine of theta. And y here, of course, is I'm going to vary this from uh, uh, minus the, uh, this point here. So this will be minus half the width of the slit all the way up to here, which will be plus half the width of the slit. So if I want to write down the uh, wave function for this wave here, then what I'm going to have is that psi, um, which is now going to be a function of y, is going to be equal to, well, first of all, I need the amplitude. Now we're using Huygens principle, so I'm treating this point as a source of waves. The amplitude of this source is going to be proportional to the size of this um, uh, the, the, the size of this point here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that that the total amplitude is equal to something called a. So this is the total amplitude. So the amplitude from this point is going to be a divided by the total width of the slit. And I'm assuming that the slit width here is going to be uh, equal to lowercase a. So it's going to be big A over lowercase a times the length of the source that we're considering. And so this is going to be times delta y. Because obviously, the larger this is, the larger the amplitude this wavelet is going to contribute. So this gives me the amplitude for this little tiny point here um, on the wave front. And then that is going to be multiplied by the cosine. Well, the distance that this central wave travels is going to be kr. And then, of course, it's a wave, so we've got minus omega t. But this wave here doesn't just travel k times r. It travels k times r plus y sine theta. So I also have to add this on. This is ky sine theta. So this will give me the 
contribution, I should call this delta psi, um, this is the contribution I get from this tiny little component here of the wave front at the slit. So to find the total wave that I get on the screen, what I have to do now is I have to integrate, so psi here is going to be the sum of all of these small components, and we're going to take the limit as delta y goes to zero, and then instead of a sum of all these tiny wavelets, I end up with an integral, and it's going to be the integral from minus a over 2 to plus a over 2, because this here is minus a over 2 in y, and this is plus a over 2, because the slit width is a, and I'm taking here to be 0. So when I do that, I'm integrating from minus a over 2 to a over 2 of this function. So this is going to be big A over little a times the cosine of kr minus omega t plus ky sine theta times dy. So I'm integrating this expression with respect to y. So to do this, what I want to do is I want to expand out this cosine term. And when I do that, I can use the cosine addition formula. So this term is going to be equal to the cosine of, and I'm going to take this term here and this term here. So this will be my a, if you like, and this will be my b, and so I'm doing cosine of a plus b. So cosine here will be uh, kr minus omega t times the cosine of ky sine theta. And then for the cosine, the second term is negative, and then it's the sine of uh, kr minus omega t times the sine of ky sine theta. Now, I'm integrating this from minus a over 2 to plus a over 2, and I'm integrating it with respect to y, so let's have a look at this term here. Now, I could just do the integration, and there's nothing to stop me doing this, but I'm going to take a little bit of a shortcut, because this is a sine term. And if I plot a sine term versus uh, uh, the i, so if I've got the sine of y, and so this is y, and this is the uh, sine of you know something times y, so let's, let's call it alpha times y, then you can see that this is uh, a sine wave, and it's, it's anti-symmetrical about the origin. And I am integrating from a over 2 to, uh, from minus a over 2 to a over 2, so I am taking symmetrical distances on either side of the origin, and so clearly this area here is going to cancel with this area here, so my net answer is always going to be 0. This will always give me 0 as long as these limits are uh, you know, symmetrical on either side of the origin, and that is because sine is an odd function. In other words, the sine of x is equal to minus the sine of minus x. So that will always give me a cancellation. And it's easy to see here, if you integrated this sine function up, you'd get a cosine, and then I'd evaluate it from minus to plus the same limit, and that would give me the same value in both cases because cosine is a symmetrical function. So this means that the only term that's going to give me a contribution is this term here. So let's replace this term with this one, and we'll evaluate the integral. So here we have the integral we came up with last time, with I'm only left with this uh, cosine term here, and I'm integrating this with respect to y, and when I do that, the only term that matters is this term I've underlined here, because that's the only thing with y in it, and that's what we're integrating with respect to. So this term here is treated as a constant when we're doing the integration. So I'm left with this constant outside here, and then I'm left with this expression inside the brackets because we have uh, uh, cosine integrates to sine, and then I've got a, a k sine theta times my y, so I have to divide by k sine theta. And I'm evaluating this from minus a over 2 to plus a over 2. Now when I do that, I have to remember that the uh, sine of x is equal to minus the sine of minus x. So here I'm going, I, I'm starting with uh, the sine with ka over 2 sine theta minus the sine of minus 
ka over 2 sine theta and so this minus the sine just becomes plus the sine because of this minus sine uh, here because I'm taking the negative argument to what I had before. So I'm just going to end up with 2 times the sine of this evaluated at uh, a over 2. So when I do that, let's see what I get. So I get psi here is equal to big A over little a times the cosine of kr minus omega t. And then I've got times 2 sine of and then a half ka sine theta divided by k sine theta. But if I take this 2 down here, it becomes a half, and I can take the a over here. So actually, this expression becomes a times the cosine of kr minus omega t times sine of a half ka sine theta over a half ka sine theta. Theta. And then the last thing to do is to remember that a half of k is a half times 2 pi over lambda, so the half and the 2 can cancel, and what I'm left with for my wave function is a times the cosine of kr minus omega t uh, times now the sine of and then I've got pi a over lambda times the sine of theta divided by and then pi a over lambda times the sine of theta. And this type of function has a special name. If I have the sine of x divided by x, then we call this a sinc function. And we write that sinc of x. And so this is a function that we define as a sinc function. And we want to evaluate this because this is going to give us a wave function that we get from diffraction. So let's have a look at this sinc function. So here's our sinc function, and it's sine x over x. And we can write sine x in terms of this power series. So the first question we want to ask is, what happens when x goes to zero. Well, using this power series, we can see that sine of x over x is, uh, which is our sinc function here, will equal, well, x divided by x is 1 minus, and then this will be x squared over squared over uh, 3 factorial, and so on. But of course, all of these terms will go to 0 as x goes to 0. And so we're just left with that the sinc of x uh, goes to 1 as x goes to 0. So it is well behaved when x is 0, despite the fact that if you just looked at it here, you get the sine of 0 divided by 0, which is 0 over 0. But in this limit, we actually get 1 um, because uh, of the, we can express this sine as a power series. So the next question we want to ask is uh, the sinc function we actually have here is the sinc of pi a over lambda times the sine of theta. And what we want to ask is, where is this zero, right? When do we get a zero in our diffraction pattern? Well, we're going to get a zero. Obviously, this 1 over x term is never going to give a zero. So we're going to get a zero when the sine of pi a over lambda times the sine of theta is equal to zero. And this happens when pi times a over lambda times the sine of theta is equal to some integer number of pi, where n now is equal to 1, 2, uh, 3, and so on, but not 0. Because when we have 0, we have this case here, where the sinc function gives us 1. And this is a special case because we have this 1 over x term on the bottom here. So this is not the case when n is equal to 0. So we have to be clear about that. So looking at this equation, we can solve it, and we can cancel the pi here. And so we get a 0 when the sine of theta is equal to n lambda over a. So in other words, that will be equal to lambda, um, lambda over a, uh, 2 lambda over a, and so on and so forth. 
but of course we can also have negative values for sine so we can actually have plus or minus this plus or minus this and similarly n is going to be plus or minus each of these integers but not zero is the most important exclusion here so we know where the zeros are we know there's going to be a maximum uh, a maximum amplitude at the origin so let's plot this function and see what it looks like so here what we've done is we've plotted sine theta on the uh, x-axis here so remember this is the angle away from the normal to, of the plane of the slit and up here we've plotted both the uh, amplitude and the amplitude is shown in green here so this is the amplitude here and we've shown the intensity that's plotted in in blue so first thing to note when we look at the amplitude is that we see this enormous peak in the center and that is our sync function uh, acting there the limit is one and so we get this broad central peak and we see that there is a zero that occurs here and this occurs at lambda over a we get another zero that occurs at two lambda over a and similarly on the other side this zero occurs at lambda over a and this one here at two lambda over a and so on and so forth now the way we get the intensity is remember that the intensity is proportional to the amplitude squared so we just square this expression here um, this is the amplitude so we just square it and that's how we get the intensity and the intensity is what we see when we project the light onto the screen so let's see if our prediction matches what actually happens and let's have a look at a single slit diffraction pattern for light. So what we've got here is a demonstration of the single wide slit diffraction pattern. So we need a coherent source of light and the easiest coherent source of light is to use a laser. So we have a green laser here and that's been fired at a uh, slit here. So there's a single slit in the middle of this and the light passes through the slit and is then incident on the white screen behind me. Now, if we zoom in on that pattern, what you can see is the central bright maximum um, that we expected from our uh, prediction. And on either side of that, both sides, there are narrower bright fringes that reduce in intensity quite rapidly as we move away from the central maximum. And these, in between these, there is a, a, a dark um, band where we have cancellation of the light. And so we get a pattern that is exactly consistent with our sync function that we derived from Huygens' principle being applied to a single slit. So now we've seen how light diffracts through a single slit. We've done the derivation and we've shown that the pattern agrees with exactly what we calculated. So that's fine for a single slit, but if you remember back to when we were demonstrating uh, diffraction with waves, with water waves in the ripple tank, we also looked at diffraction from two slits. And in the next video, we'll have a look at the pattern that we expect to get when light diffracts through two slits. Thank you.